Hi everyone. Today I'm going to pull apart one of my photographs and uh, share a little bit of behind the scenes with you in terms of how I create it. And it's gonna be a little fun. So it was something a little different for me. I shared the image before and we'll just wait for a few more people to join us before I kick this off. But image deconstructs are such a great way to kind of, I suppose, see, you know, the, the what goes into the thought process and where you get your in image inspiration from and how then you go about creating something and bringing it to life to capture it in camera. Hi, good morning. So yeah, we thought we'd, uh, we'd share one of my, my probably more recent images with you today and, and see, uh, see what you guys think. But I'd love for you to pop some questions into the comments if you have any about um, creating single capture images, anything like that as we go through this process and I share some behind the scenes with you and talk a little bit about um, the concept, the, you know, obviously where I found my inspiration and then trying to come up with the, uh, the actual, I suppose, prop is what we're going to call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it wasn't really a prop, but it was more of a, um, a creation. It was like it's not even a sculpture either. No, it's it's, it's a paper cutout, really, <laughs> um, to be honest with you. So, I'll go through all of that and then show you the thought process behind how I was going to place a baby into a particular scene, and then how I was going to capture it in terms of lighting and composition. So yeah, this is going to be a little bit fun. This one because it did take me a while to come up with. I suppose the um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, I was scared to create something like this because it wouldn't work. So it, it was, it was a while before it actually, I got the courage to actually want to create something like this because I had been inspired heavily by this particular, um, art form and I'd always wanted to create something, but I just couldn't get my head around how I did it uh, or how I could achieve it. So I thought I'd share that with you today, which is very cool. So we've got a few people watching. We've got 35 on so far. Ah, so. fantastic. Well, let me get this started so I'm not taking up too much of your time. Alrighty. Here we go. Slideshow is up. All right. So I've got some images here that I'm going to share with you. And then we've also got a video. Um, <laughs> Have an alarm set for 7.30 p.m. every day. <laughs> ah, thank you. That's very, very cool. <laughs> That's all yeah. Well, do you know what... Um, We've been, like, like I've said it a couple of times, we've been receiving so many beautiful messages and comments in the group and, and posts from people just saying how great it is to, to have these lives every day and it's very motivating and, and keeping people, you know, focused and going and so forth and moving forward. And, and for us, it's exactly the same because I can assure you that we have bad days too. Um, you know, it is a lot to, to work with at the moment in terms of, the overwhelming impact that this is having on the world and everyone in it. Uh, people are being affected by this very closely with losing loved ones, with being sick themselves from the virus, um, and even just the impact that it's having on their businesses as well. So, and there's a lot of people here in the group that work in the front lines that are putting themselves at risk every single day just so we can get through this and survive it. And do you know what? Like, there are days I'm, I'm not always smiling. <laughs> we were talking about this before. I'm not always, you know, the person that you probably see every day here during these lives. I do feel the weight of the world. I do feel stressed. I, I worry all the time how it's impacting my family and my business. And I worry about our staff as well and how it's affecting them. And I worry about everyone here in the community and, and, and trying to obviously find the courage every day to get up, get dressed, and put a face on, like I've done today. I really didn't feel like it today. But I know when I do it, I feel better. And when I just keep focusing on something, something small, like today is an image deconstruct, I know when I go through this with you, I'm gonna hopefully inspire you to wanna create something that's personal, that's for you, that's going to challenge you, that's going to push you. And that's what it's all about. It's about pushing ourselves. It's about the struggle and getting through it to get stronger and, and, and face every day, get up and just show up. 
um, and that's what we're doing. So, uh, yeah, I do appreciate every single one of you that joins me for these lives. I love the questions. I love sharing with you. And I love seeing everyone's posts and all of your own creative processes coming to life with everything that you're sharing in here. It has just been so rewarding for us as a team and it is very motivating for us as well. So I just want to thank you. And, um, and being a Friday, we're going to head into the weekend so you won't see me over the weekend. Um, I want to leave you with, you know, something I suppose that will, you know, really kind of push you and motivate you here. All right, so let's get started after I've had my little little babble. Okay, so this was the image that I shared just before um, in a post, and I said that I was going to break it down and, and explain how I captured it in camera. So when I say captured in camera, that means it's not a composite. So everything that you see right here on the screen, obviously this is the edited version, um, is how I captured it in camera as one single shot. And I think, you know, the thought process that goes behind a, a, an image like this, like I said, I didn't have the courage to create it because I didn't quite know how to go about it. And then it was, I was challenging myself within my brain and trying to stop myself from doing it because I knew that it would be hard. But when I actually stopped and I removed all of those blocks and I thought about, right, um, how are we going to create this? So to start with, I'll show you where I found my inspiration. And there are many artists out there who create these amazing shadow boxes. And they um, are lit from behind with light. Some aren't, some are, but um, the ones that I was very fascinated with was this layering of paper and then the way that the light flowed through it. I think for me that's what really grabbed my eye because as a photographer, light is our most important tool. It's our most valuable tool as a photographer in terms of how we capture it. It creates, you know, so much impact and, um, and, and yeah, so many different other elements in, in terms of lighting, but we'll come to that later. Uh, so, yeah, when I came across a lot of these shadow boxes, I was like, how do they make that? How do they get it so, um, you know, the detail and the depth there? So I started to think about how I could create my own and, and come up with a concept in terms of putting a baby into a space um, in between layers and telling a story and for me a lot of the shadow boxes that I was really sort of naturally drawn to um, were very much nature scenes so um, when I think about you know a baby being born into this world um, you know we are surrounded by mother nature every single day and we rely heavily on it and obviously there's a lot going on with you know um, the world at the moment so for me it was creating something that really did resemble Mother Nature. Um, when I went about the, the thought process behind how many different layers of paper and how many um, different elements and how I would have the light positioned behind it to, to draw you through the scene, I started to kind of map out. Now, this looks like an absolute mess. Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> about now. Oh, you muted yourself, that's all. Oh, here we go. Well, let's sit it up here <laughs> on the table. Perfect. I sat back in the chair, I'm so sorry, and I've sat on my microphone. <laughs> Not a great start to the day. Thank you for letting us know. Thank you. 
Um, okay, so I'll go, I'll rewind a little bit in terms of, um, I'm not quite sure where that dropped out. So what I was saying was, uh, this here is a screenshot of my multiple layers in Photoshop. And they were a meter, it was a meter squared. So um, it, each side was a meter long. And this was cut out on a roll of paper that was um, 44 inches wide. Ah, fantastic, we've got the sound back. I'm sorry, my mic pack, I was leaning on it in my chair. <laughs> um, not great. <laughs> Very professional, Kelly. So this does look like a mess because it is um, obviously layers in, in Photoshop, but it was how I was going to cut them out as individual layers. And I, I, can, I can share with you that there was a little bit of trial and error. So I would start to sort of cut them out and look through and go, right, I need to make that space a little bit bigger or this area is cutting through a part of um, something else that I needed to bring down. So there was um, a lot of turning on and off of layers to get it just right. And then what I did was, there's 11 layers here and you can see them as the, the opacity is brought down. Um, as a flattened image here, the 11 layers were printed individually. So each layer was its own print a meter by a meter. And then I sat with a Stanley knife and I cut out the shapes. So you can see this one here at the back. I've, that was a, an entire square piece of paper and I've cut out that circle. And then the next layer, um, that was another square sheet of paper printed and I cut out along those lines following them. So it was the process of how, where the lines would be placed within the scene to give you that, that layered effect. So as the light fell through the shadow box, it gave it sort of that um, graduated um, impact of light from light to dark and created that separation and distance between each layer. So trying to explain it really <laughs> is very hard, but the video will explain it a lot better for you in a moment. So um, as you can see here, you know, the, there were 11 layers and I had to sit and intricately cut out, if we go back, to all of these little details. So you can see here's a layer at the back with the circle cut out. There's another layer with another circle cut out. And then there's another layer and then it starts to kind of um, cross over and change. And then up here you can see these are sort of the trees and things like that in the forest, um, cutting all of those out with a Stanley knife. So it took me roughly around, uh, it took me probably an, I don't know, five, six hours to cut the whole thing out. And then there were pieces that I made mistakes on, so I would have to reprint them and recut them out. Um, so there was a lot of time that went into it. And down here with the last layer, the very front layer, with the reeds in the grass, cutting those out and making sure that they would stand up. So I had to use a paper that was, that, you know, was quite thick. Um, I ended up using very expensive Canson Infinity paper <laughs> <laughs> because I needed the, um, you know, the, the thickness, the, the weight of the paper to have it stand, have those little pieces stand up. I did use pieces of sticky paper and you'll see shortly um, how I got that, some of the pieces to stay in place and then I just had to clone those out, the, the pieces of sticky paper out and um, sticky tape. Sticky tape sticky paper, <laughs> sticky tape out in post-production. So yeah, as we go through, um, you can see now these individual pieces of paper that I've cut out and as I've started to layer it. To keep the structure upright, what I did was we, these are just um, pieces of polystyrene. So I had some spare sheets of polystyrene um, out the back and what I did was I would just use a Stanley knife and I would cut them so that I could attach the paper to both sides so I could pull the paper tight um, for it to stay completely in place. I've got two backdrop stands with arms going straight ahead so you can see and then I've just taped the polystyrene um, to the backdrop stand to keep them upright. And I had to make sure obviously that the distance between each sheet of paper was nice and even as well to give it that depth. So you can see here side on, there's my studio. So it doesn't look so great side on, but this gives <laughs> you a much better idea of how I cut out each individual sheet of paper. 
Um, and it is, someone said, you're one dedicated person. And you know what? That's what it takes to bring an idea and a creation to life. Yeah. And it's really important that you dedicate time to work on personal projects like this because I can tell you the reason I wanted to share this particular photograph was because I learned so much through the process. And what it did was it prepared me, the way that I had to create these different layers, it prepared me to then be able to go on and create other different photographs and sculptures and things like that. Because the thought process behind how you were gonna capture something in camera was so much more involved than just taking a photograph and then going into Photoshop and going, oh, well, that might look good with this photo and then bringing another photo in and then going, oh, I've got this, that might work. I can tell you from a creative perspective, when you spend the time and dedicate the time to you know putting it into something like this and pulling it off the rewards are so great i did create this for an award image because i love to push the boundaries and create things that are slightly different so um, the whole idea behind this was to create an image that challenged the judges in terms of what they were seeing as a single capture and that had impact and storytelling um, and a storytelling nature to it so if you can see here when I talk about now how I'm going to bring light through the setup. I've got here, it's a little flex panel. It's an LED daylight um, continuous light. It's a, a Westcott flex panel. It's just um, a foot square and they're just little LEDs. So to create the beautiful um, warm orange light, I don't even know if I've still got one here, but hang on two seconds. Because it was a. Um, it was one of was it, these. Was it the. I, yeah. Yeah. It's probably. I don't. It's not a wrap that I use. <laughs> <laughs> it's not this particular wrap, but it is the same wrap in a different colour, but it was more of an orange colour. And um, what I did was I layered the wrap over the top of the light and then I turned the light up so it pushed, and you could do this with gels, you could do it with anything. For me, I lit it with white light, obviously, daylight balance light, and I had a look at the way the light passed through the, um, through the shadow box, so you can see there how it's lighter at the back, and as, it, the, gradu as the light falls off coming towards me, um, you know, you can see how it's getting darker towards the front, so I'm like, no, I, I, it needs to have something. It needs to have some warmth added to it. So I just looked around my studio and I found this orange wrap. Um, I've probably put it away because it's not something that I would use. It was given to me. And I placed that over the light source itself. So the light went through the orange wrap and then created this beautiful warm um, light that I went on to work with. So yeah, you can see how those different layers are kind of a f a impacting there and you can see there's a lot of my, my pencil drawings and things like that. So this is just an iPhone photo um, captured there on my phone just to kind of see how that light was falling and then obviously see where all of the different layers were sitting within each other as well. Um, when it came to photographing the baby, if we come back, you can see I've got my fake baby in here. So I wanted the baby on the, the same plane as the silhouette of the mother's face, so the mother nature's face. And I, what I did was I created the, the mother nature one on a separate, um, separate statue. Actually, if we flick back through, you can see her there. So she's on her own stand, and that's where I intended to place the baby. And when I had the little posy there, um, it wasn't quite high enough. So at the time of the shoot, what I had to do was actually rethink how can I position that baby upright and put a little bit more height behind the head to get it in the exact right position. So I ended up just grabbing one of my crates and putting the posy then inside that, which kind of lifted it up a little bit more and created a bit more of a, a firmer support around the outside of the baby. And then I just used little pillows to help position the face and so forth. Now, I used two babies to get this right <laughs> because the first baby was actually when we were doing our building here at the studio, we were building the other studio that we have here, one of the builders had actually had a baby and I was like, oh, come in, I'll take some photographs. And, um, and so I thought he'd be a great baby, great model to use for this. 
and he wasn't. He was so big. <laughs> he was such a big, big baby. And um, it, it was, he was wide awake the entire time. So it didn't quite work out the first time I went to shoot this. So I left my structure in place and I did another model call. And so when I'm working with a concept and idea, it doesn't always have to be for a client. I'm more than happy to get a model in who is prepared to, you know, go ahead, go along with my crazy ideas every now and then. But then obviously when I do those model calls, I will take other photographs for them as well. So right now you can see this orange light coming through here. Most people don't want to be photographed with an orange light because it's not very flattering. <laughs> <laughs> and when babies are very red, um, getting those skin tones perfect can be a little tricky as well. But you can see that light coming through from the front and, um, and how it, it is creating that warmth uh, as it comes through each of those layers. So yeah, that's me thinking about how I'm going to get that baby in position, where I'm going to place it and so forth. And then what I did was I had my, com my, um, my computer set up here on a stool and you can see the orange label here. That's, whoops, what's just happened there? That's tethered um, to my camera. So I was actually taking the photographs. I set my camera up on a tripod. I got the focus right, right on the baby. I shot this um, with, a, with a larger aperture and quite a high ISO, um, but it means I had to get that um, exposure just right. But you can see that beautiful warm light coming through. So I was taking the photographs from my laptop through Lightroom tethered to my camera, which meant I still had full control over all of the settings in my camera and I didn't have to move um, in terms of safety for that baby. Uh, I could have had an assistant um, in I here working is, with me. This is the second shoot, isn't it? Yeah. Because the, the first shoot you actually did it handheld and that'll be the video that we show. Mm. Um, and we learnt a lot because I was in the way. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. Sometimes we come up with these ideas and concepts and it doesn't quite work the first time. So you've yeah. got to go, right, what can I do differently? So the first shot, which is what you're going to see in the video in a second, was um, the very first baby, which was very, very challenging. And this was the second baby that I got in and um, I went, right, I need to be there with that baby and have my hands on it because coming back and the thing was, what happened during the first shoot, which you'll see in a second, is that every time I went back to take a photograph, I had to completely line up my composition again to make sure that it was completely square in my frame to get that perspective right. Because if I was slightly off, it would have skewed the entire square frame of the image. And so every time I would put the camera down to go back and get the baby back into position, I was coming back and it was just taking for, forever. So I thought, do you know what? I just need to get that camera set up on a tripod, make it completely square within my frame, get that perspective spot on, and then adjust the exposure for the light. And then I can focus all of my attention on that baby. So I learned a lot, like Garrett said, in that first shoot. So, um, We've got a question here from um, Olya. How do you connect a laptop to your camera? So I've used a Tether Tools lead here. So I've basically, um, actually Garrett, can you grab my camera? Yeah. It's sitting just over there. And I tether through Lightroom. So obviously you would have to have um, the right Tether Tools lead for your camera. It's not your camera, but it's, not, it's, it's a, similar. It's Mark IV, isn't it? Yeah. Ah, perfect. <clears throat> so we just connect it through the HDMI over here um, to the Tether Tools lead and then connect that to the laptop and using Lightroom I'm able to have full control over my camera. But it is going to be different for every camera maker model in terms of what lead you need to do but if you're interested in, in tethering um, you just need to contact like a local camera supplier and they will then be able to advise you what lead you'll need for your camera maker model. The Tether Tools website's really good for that. Oh, it's brilliant. And you can order all of that online as well. Yeah. Yeah, if you're in Australia, KL supplies them. If you're in the US, B&H um, have them. And I'm not quite sure in the UK, my apologies. But Tether Tools, every time I go to the UK, it always has a booth at SWPP. <laughs> 
I saw this kind of construction on Pinterest but didn't know how to do it. You are so welcome and that's just it. Like I'm always looking at different um, artists and different mediums for inspiration as to what I can create and I want to kind of inspire all of you to do the same thing because it's how we you know, create unique work. It's how we stand out from everyone else and it's how we you know, we, we focus on what we want to create as artists, as photographers, so that we're not doing the same thing over and over again, and we're creating something that we can be truly proud of. What dimension square or rectangle? So this is, each sheet of paper is cut square, and it's a meter by a meter, so a meter on all sides. And I've shot this, um, in camera, obviously landscape, and then I've cropped it as a square in post to um, to keep that square shot. So yeah, I'm going to go through the video now um, that Garrett's created. Here we go. With a heap of behind the scenes footage, which is what we always love to do because it's great to show the process. And this was created in 2018, so two years ago, and it's taken me this long to share it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what as an artist sometimes you don't always want to share all of your secrets and that's okay um, what you come up with and your ideas that's your you know that's your information your um, thing so this is me adjusting the baby and getting Garrett to tell me whether or not it's high enough in the right position and so forth yeah. he had the most gorgeous set of hair and so as we said before this was the first shoot so this was where all the learning kind of happened and, you know, the finessing and, and I suppose, because, because it was a concept that you weren't sure on. You had to learn, you know, how to, how to actually make it happen, so. Yeah, I did give them a photograph of this, but he was really quite fidgety and kept moving, you can see, and I couldn't quite get the, the hands and feet to stay exactly where I wanted them, so I had to come back and think about how I'm going to position him. And because I had the side profile of the, the woman's face above, I wanted to make sure that I had the side profile of the baby there as well. Um, was that it? Yep. Perfect. So yeah, this is obviously the final image. So what I did in post-production was I went through each layer um, of paper Just and I removed okay. why isn't it not working well mate <laughs> hold on here we go I know what I'm doing there we are uh, so I went through in post-production each layer of paper and I removed any sort of little pencil markings that I'd had from cutting it out and if I could go back and do it again I'd do it slightly different as well but at the end of the day what went into creating this and the time that it took to get to this point, it's something I'm really proud of as a photographer because I learnt so much in the process and I created something that was really different and unique. So when I entered this uh, at WPPI, obviously there was a panel of judges and they have a judging criteria in front of them and they are looking for obviously all of the different elements which I'll go through with you in a moment. But it was a bit challenging for them because you aren't sure how it's created. Um, you, it, it does make you kind of think, well, how was this done in a category that is single capture? Yeah. And that's one of the rules. Uh, anyway, she followed the rules. Always follow the rules. <laughs> um, it ended up scoring a, a 90, um, oh, 90 something, a 91 or a 92, which is a gold award, which is something that any photographer should be extremely proud of because it just means that you are exhibiting, you know, um, unique, exceptional, um, you know, work in terms of its its technical skill and craft. So for me, I was it was a very proud moment to to see that go up and be judged because we always can need to push ourselves as photographers. We need to continually be looking at at things and standing back and taking scenes in and using our imagination to come up with different ideas and concepts and and creating work that's truly ours and even though I've been inspired by a concept I didn't copy someone's exact concept so it's an idea that I've, I've taken as inspiration from something else and I think that's what we need to be reminded of all the time is that we have to 
we, it's very it's very okay to be inspired by someone else's work but try to figure out what what has caught your eye the most about that work so instead of trying to copy it you know exactly what is it that you you know were really drawn to in the first place when you look at someone else's work is it the and for me it was the light it was how light passed through the shades of paper and then how the, could I create something that was similar and, and have that same impact and that same sort of um, result. So yeah, when we are looking at all of the different things, when I come up with my ideas and my concepts, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking about, is it gonna have the right amount of impact? Will it make the judges wanna get up out of their seats? And this doesn't, it, does, it doesn't even have to be for a competition. It can be just for anything because when you look at a photograph, and it could be any photograph, and if you think about all of the photographs that you have in your home, you think about your favorite photographs of all time, you think about a photograph that you've seen somewhere else that you will never forget, the, because it's created impact, and that's based on an emotional level. Uh, you, you see photographs sometimes and you go, ah. Oh, Right? That's what we want as baby photographers for people, anyone, whether it be friends and family of the people that we're photographing or complete strangers. What we want to create is, um, is a, a great feeling. Sometimes though, when people look at photographs, they, they're like, ah, oh, that gives me an, an, an uncomfortable feeling. Or, oh, that poor baby. Or, Yep, wow, that's, in, that's pretty amazing. I'm not really sure how to feel about that. And so when you go through the range of emotions of when you look at different photographs, when I create something, I'm constantly thinking about how I'm gonna make those judges feel in terms of impact and, and on that emotional level. Um, will Rise still be going ahead? It is going ahead. Uh, we have just delayed it a little while. We are gonna announce next week the new dates but we thought with what everyone's going through right now and not having the ability to go out and photograph for the awards, which I know a lot of people like to do, we thought we'd just hold off a little bit longer and give people some more time um, you know, to get through this partic particular situation that we're all experiencing so we can focus on other things. So yeah, and it gives people a little bit more time to, I suppose, get, um, get going with some ideas. But creativity in terms of is it original? So obviously, if I was, sub, you know, submitting this and it was going up against all the other shadow boxes, it wouldn't be original. But because I was submitting this into a photographic competition, it was definitely original because it hadn't been done before. So I've got to think about that element as well: composition. Um, how am I going to? create something that's going to draw the viewer into the photograph and the different layers and the light and the way that it passed through and over the subjects and the way that I positioned the silhouette of the lady and the baby facing each other that's the the way that I used composition to keep the viewer in the center there and gazing and looking away around the image and if you have a look a lot of the lines continue to draw you back to the main subject. So as these lines come around, everything tends to draw you back into the main subject, which was the goal. So a lot of these circular lines, the layering of it just continually draws you back. The lines of the reed draw you, draw you up to the baby. The reeds over here draw you up to the mother and then down to the baby as well. So that in terms of composition is another element that I was thinking about and how I would draw this to create the balance and use leading lines to keep the viewer um, you know, engaged. And then light, obviously, how it passed through the subject and lit it and created that layering effect. The color balance, so I went with you know, that, that beautiful sort of orange color. And obviously right at the back there where it is the brightest, I had that, that flex panel, that light up really close in the end um, to the back there and at its full power. So obviously that's going to be very bright as I'm capturing it in camera based on the camera settings. And then as that light falls off and becomes softer and less intense as it moves through, it becomes warmer with those orange tones. Uh, so that color harmony, that color balance was really important as well for me. 
the paper quality in terms of printing, when I presented this in a print competition, um, I printed each of those layers of paper on Canson Infinity paper and I printed my final print on Canson Infinity paper. And um, the quality for me is always really important as well because when I do go to print a photograph for any type of competition, there are different types of papers out there. So I will print the photograph on three different mediums and then what I'll do is I'll have a look at that under a particular light setting and I'll see which paper is giving my photograph the right level of um, you know, contrast and depth and sharpness and tonal range. So yeah, there's a lot to consider in that aspect. The other thing, um, you know, in terms of exposure, the way that I mounted it, I kept it, you know, nice and square that framed the square so that presentation was right. Uh, when we look at the photographic technique, I suppose, the posing, you know, I had to think about how am I going to pose the baby. I look at this now and I think to myself, if I could go back and repose that baby, I would pull the little toes out. I would make sure I could see both hands. But sometimes when you are in a moment and you just want to get that <laughs> shot, you can rush and you can miss things. And it's not until later that you go, um, so someone's saying here, how was the baby lit? So each layer of paper is white. So there's going to be some type of bounce back reflection of light. There was no light in the front. There was only light coming through the back. So you can see that the, the lights that are hitting the edge of the baby there, um, but then the layers of paper in front being all white, obviously they look dark here, but if you come back here, each piece of paper is reflecting light back towards that baby. So as that light is passing through here, it is hitting each of these layers and bouncing back and creating that softness and that depth between each layer and that's what's so cool about it. Yeah. Um, so what are we up to here? So storytelling and subject matter. Obviously I wanted to create something that was really different and I, I, I titled it Mother Nature so it's got the trees, it's got the mother, the silhouette of her coming through the trees and to that little baby. Um, but yeah, that's what it's all about for me. And I think, um, oh, what judges said during the critique. Yeah, I think what they're trying to say there is, so what did they say and how did they come to the conclusion that it was one shot? Was that an issue going into it? Did you have to prove it, I suppose? Yeah, so the thing with WPPI when I entered their print competitions, the categories that are single capture, you have to upload a raw file. So I have to send through the raw image and they then look at it and go, right, does the, um, the final image that's been submitted, you know, does that um, represent, you know, in terms of um, how we've adjusted it and how we've uh, edited it, does, you know, have we kept the integrity of the file in piece intact? and not altered it too much. So for me, all I had to do was work on those graduations of tone um, to make sure that there was separation between each layer as it was photographed. But yeah, for the judging, it was interesting because if you've ever sat in a room and had a photograph of yours judged, it's a very overwhelming feeling and it doesn't matter how many times you sit there, when your print comes up, it feels like your heart is about to jump out of your chest. It's very hard to swallow. <laughs> and you are, hearing, you are hearing things, but you're not hearing everything. And for me, uh, when I was sitting at the back of the room watching this one get judged, there was a lot of time spent by the judges up very close looking at the photograph. And what they do is they take it all in and then they start to reassess the elements, the judging criteria, and then the rules of how it was created. And then they start to see element like look for things that could potentially pull it down in terms of technical excellence and flaws. Um, but yeah, it's not until the conversation. So when you are in a space like that, the judges will sit back down. There is no conversation. They don't talk while they're up looking at it. It's very quiet. And then they have their little keypad and they'll put their score in and they'll sit and wait. And then it's the average of those five scores that will come up. And this is where if one judge or maybe two judges feel that it deserves a higher score, they can challenge it depending on how many points they are away from the final average. So at this point, the image was challenged and then 
each of the judges have an opportunity to have a discussion about the photograph and what they see. And it wasn't until that point that you start kind of hearing their feedback. And there was a couple of judges that were like, you know, I'm really struggling to understand how this was created. And then there was another judge that was like, look at how this has been created in camera. I don't even know how this was done. So the fact that I challenged them, I think, made them go, right, well, I've never seen anything like this. And that's what we've got to constantly look for when we are creating pieces of work and how we want to impress the judges. And for me, there's nothing I love more than going to judging experiences and watching the caliber of work increase and improve every single year. And that bar is raised continuously year after year because of the new work that people are entering and submitting from being inspired by previous years and listening to the feedback from judges of where images could be handled possibly better. So yeah, for me, that's the whole process. I absolutely love it. It pushes me outside my comfort zone. I learn so much in the process and I love sharing it with you guys. <laughs> as far as the, the judging process goes, I, I don't enter awards and I'm not a photographer, but going along with Kelly to the judging is such an experience and seeing how the professionals, the judges, see each individual image is just mind-blowing because sometimes you look at an image and go, oh my gosh, I absolutely love that. Oh, how did they do it? It's absolutely beautiful. But then it can get um, you know, critiqued in such a way and you start to look at things and you're like, I would never have seen that. And I suppose it's how somebody else sees it. And that's what you do a lot with the critiques that we do each month as well, one coming up next Friday. Um, is, you know, somebody else's eyes looking at something. It's not until somebody else looks at it that you go, I would never have seen that. Totally. You know, that, that process of... And this is why I, I continually repeat, you've got to find something that's unique to you. You've got to follow your vision and, 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 and find what it is that you love because we all have within us the ability to see things differently. So every judge on that panel, on any panel, any given day, all five of those judges will see something like what Garrett's talking about that is very different to the next judge. And then it's like, oh, wow, I didn't even see that. And that's what it's about as artists. We are the same. So when we are creating work, we want to create unique work that captures their attention and has impact. And you know what? I'm not going to tell you to go out and enter competitions. That's up to you of where you want to take your career as a photographer. But I know for me, it has pushed me so much as a photographer. And, you know, I still have so much more to learn and so much more to create and capture. And I, I, I thought to myself, right, once I get to this point, and I was very, very lucky this year to um, achieve my Grand Masters and I'm one of nine people in the world at WPPI that have our Grand Masters, so that was pretty amazing. First baby photographer. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought once I got the, to there, I'd be okay with that and I would slow down. But I'm actually even more inspired now to push myself even further and see what else I can create you know, in the next few years, I've actually even set myself a goal for January 2022. And when I start thinking about what I'm gonna create for then, so it's, it is an ongoing process and I think we have to remember as photographers, if we sit back right now with what's happening in the world and we don't pick up our camera and we focus on all of the other things that are happening in the world right now, it's very hard in a month's time or two months time to pick back up where you left off. And that's why I'm, I'm trying to encourage as many people as possible to keep working at their craft because there shouldn't be a day that goes by that you aren't inspired in some way by something that catches your eye. Um, and when you truly love and, and are passionate about your craft, that's how you will feel every day. I swore to myself many years ago, the day I feel I wake up and I, I don't feel passionate about photography anymore is the day I will give up. And I'm nearly 17 years in and I love it more than anything right now. And I think what's happening in the world today is actually 
making me even more inspired and passionate to create more meaningful pieces because we are experiencing change and the way that we move forward as you know as societies we will things will be different and photography is going to have a huge impact on that as well yeah. and how we capture it for sure uh, there are a couple of questions here did you mention what competition was your first uh, my very first competition was um, the uh, oh well I actually entered a newspaper competition if we want to go back that far <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then when um, I I think it was 2008 was the very first time I entered the Queensland, which is the state that I live in in Australia, the, uh, the state awards of the AIPP. So I entered, um, I entered there and I think I got one silver, which was fantastic. And when I started to get a little bit more confidence, I entered their, their national awards, the Australian Institute of Professional Photography. And I stopped entering those a few years ago but I started entering WPPI, um, which is held in Las Vegas every year, and uh, it's going to be March 2021, I had to think <laughs> about the year. Um, it's, uh, it's a print competition, uh, which is very similar in terms of the way that it's run to how the Australian Professional Photography Awards were run. So it was easy for me to sort of move over to that competition because it was, the process was very, very much the same as how it was run here in Australia. And that first time I entered there was in 2012. And I got one silver out of three entries entered. And I have, I've, I've entered every year since. Yes. So that's been pretty cool. I also enter SWPP in the UK, their print competition. I love, it's very similar again to the WPPI process. So for me, prints matter and seeing my prints on display uh, is probably one of the most rewarding things um, as a photographer. So yeah. All right. Um, may I see the beginning of the criteria list again? You can rewatch this at any time. So. All right. So uh, impact, and regardless of whether you are entering a competition or not, these are the different elements that should go into making something a piece of art. Impact, creativity, composition, lighting color balance, technical excellence, photographic technique, and storytelling and subject matter. So in no particular order, those elements should be what you are considering every time you come up with a concept um, and an idea and that go through the, the different stages of progress into making it. So if we go back here, you know, when I was started to draw my idea and my concept, it was a mess. <laughs> my, my brain was a mess with how I was going to pull this off. And then I would, I would get up and I would walk away and I would come back and I would go, right, okay, so let's turn off all the other layers and now let's turn the layers back on as we go through the different pieces of paper in terms of their placement, as you can see here. So I had to take the digital version of this and create a physical version and how I would get it to, to sit upright and the distance between each piece. So as it, they've got a little closer here as they've kind of gone towards the front there, but as they've gone um, from the back through, the distance was a little greater and then it gradually got a little smaller. Here it needed to be a bit bigger because of obviously what I needed to put the baby in, but the pieces became a little closer here as the light fell off. Um, and then it was just a matter of, right, I need to move this piece forward more or I need to, to pull this piece back as I was taking those shots. But um, the beautiful thing was I had a fake baby to, to really practice and, and get it perfect um, before, before I actually did it. Is it worthwhile to try and get published in magazines like Rangefinder? Do you know, I... I've never, I and mean, I have been published in magazines, but I don't think that that is going to build you an audience. Um, I, I don't, I don't think so. There's do you, many different ways. I suppose do your clients read that magazine? No, and it's yeah. who, who are you trying to gain recognition from? So, I, I am obviously an educator, 
and I have been doing education for 10 years and it's something that I'm very passionate about because I want to see other photographers reach their full potential and achieve amazing results because not only does that impact your career and make you a better photographer but it strengthens our industry as a whole and that's why I teach that's why I want to share as much as I possibly can because I love photography and I want to see our industry survive challenging times especially when everyone has an incredible camera attached to their hand 24 7. Um, so when it comes to who who do you want to be recognized by and what for what are your reasons for that for me i entered awards just to see originally it was just to see where i sit within the industry am i producing work that is considered standard everyday professional work that we should be capturing every day as professional photographers. Am I creating work that's slightly above that? Oh, and then when you get your first big award, your big gold, you don't ever want to receive anything less than that because <laughs> you think you've failed. It's a mind mess. And it's like, it's like the very first time you get up, upgraded to business class. You don't ever want to go back to cattle class or sitting at the back of the plane. <laughs> <laughs> so it pushes you every year to do better. But what that's done for me as an educator is that it's, it's, I've been recognized by my peers. And I suppose when I started entering competitions, there were no newborn or baby categories. I was entering the categories, the portrait categories, up against fine art portrait photographers and and amazing illustrative photographers and I was having to not compete against them but I was entering my work into the same category as them so judges were looking at very very different uh, styles and genres of work um, and basing their scores off that mm -hmm. so it was quite challenging from a judge's perspective as well as an entrance perspective but it just meant that I had to create work that had impact it doesn't matter what I'm you know shooting I've got to go through all of those different elements to make sure that the images meet those criteria and then I think back then baby photography wasn't really a thing like it wasn't within the industry as such within different associations and organizations you know baby photographers weren't teaching at conferences they weren't doing all of that stuff so I kind of hit the industry I suppose at the right time and I st and started to bring more awareness and attention to our genre as baby photographers and now the respect that we have I can tell you one of the most heartbreaking days as a photographer for me was posting a photograph on Facebook many years ago and I had recently won a couple of awards at my state awards and the overall winner of the state awards went on Facebook just after I had posted a baby in a bowl and he said in a comment on a post if I see another baby in a fruit bowl I'm gonna vomit and it broke my heart I was like this is someone I've looked up to this is someone that I've aspired to be to reach the same heights to produce a level of work consistently like this particular person so to see that lack of respect for what we did that pushed me like you would not believe. And it made me even more determined to bring more awareness to our craft, to what we do as baby photographers, because it's not just about creating an amazing photograph. We have to make sure a baby is safe, make sure they are comfortable. We have to contend with you know, a range of potential issues like colic, wind, reflux, um, hunger, <laughs> fussing, and for whatever reason. You can't tell your subject to um, pose. We can't <laughs> tell our subjects what to do. We have to pose them beautifully and consider composition, consider lighting for a subject that is laying down um, when most portraits are taken upright. So that's what gave me the determination and the... I suppose the drive to really push as a baby photographer for that recognition and you know we're all going to find different things that will give us drive and determination as as business owners as artists and that's what it was for me but it is now incredible to know that what we do as baby photographers is really well respected and it's they know how tough it is so I want you guys to have that same feeling I want you to feel 
that you've accomplished something great and you've pushed yourselves outside your comfort zone and um, you can be proud looking back at your career. But right now you have the ability for those of you that are home with children to show them, you know, just how far you can take your passion and create and do something that's amazing. So yeah. Anyway, that's awesome. enough from me. That's a little Friday, <laughs> Friday good feels. Um, it is Friday. I want you to have a wonderful weekend. I know it is hard to consider going into a weekend of lockdown um, as not wonderful, but there are many ways that you can spend that time with your family and celebrate um, these moments. And yeah, stay, stay, stay safe, stay healthy. Look after yourselves. I'll see you Monday. <laughs>